Thank you. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> oh. Scripture reading of God's Word today is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and is not for yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So be it. Good morning. Good morning. Good job, Merle. Let's start with prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for this nice, warm, comfortable place to come worship you, Lord. But may we worship you in any circumstances that we have. May we not lose our peace. May we not lose our faith. But may we fix our eyes upon Jesus, who left his home in heaven, humbled himself even to the death on the cross, that we might be called children of God. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that does seal us and bind us, Lord. And we pray that right now that you open our hearts, open our minds to hear your spirit, that we don't wrestle against the spirit, but, Lord, we yield to the spirit so that we can walk step in step with the spirit. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I entitled this, The Great Divorce. What's great about divorce, right? See, we're supposed to all attend a great divorce wedding celebration but for some people that will not be the case there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because they thought they were going to be there they thought they would have eternal life but Jesus says to them depart from me I do not know you what a terrible terrible day that will be for some people and I want you to realize that, like I said that's not for the people that said oh well if 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 I'm wind up in hell, so what? This is for the people who thought without a doubt that they would enter into the kingdom of heaven. If you're reading along in Acts, you know we're in Acts chapter 9, and that's the reason Paul did what he did. He was so blinded by it, but he went out and was trying to single-handedly destroy the church because he was a godly, righteous man. And he thought he was doing what was right. If anyone thought that they would wind up in heaven... <laughs> It was Saul, but he was so, so wrong. And if you're reading through in, in Matthew and you read Jesus' own words, you see so many words that have to do with what you do. But that's why I wanted to start out this sermon with, it is by grace you are saved, so that you don't forget that. You can't take one verse and take it out of context. You've got to read the entire Scripture. And if you are saved by grace then you should produce works. And again, when we get into the church, we see all kind of doctrines based on these different things where some people say you have to have works. Some people say that you know, if you do this and that, there's just so much theology here that is simply wrong. It is by grace you are saved. Nothing else. There is nothing you can do. God's amazing, wonderful grace upon grace upon grace. Grace that you're here breathing right here today, that you have your children, your family, your freedom, everything else. And the same way if you didn't have that in some other part of the country. It is by God's grace that you exist and by God's grace that He sent His one and only Son to die for you that you might live in this world and eternally. So if you believe that, if Jesus is your King, if He is your everything, if you love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength, how can you not love your neighbor? How can you not live a life that bears fruit? And by that fruit you will be recognized. You have to tie all these things together. So if you read this week, you read Matthew chapter 21 to 25. This upcoming week you will finish Matthew and I think going to Mark. Yeah, Mark. And then we go to Hebrews after that. 
you'll get to be listening to Jesus' own words as we're going through the church also and we're seeing that who would have ever thought that Saul was going to be the one building the church all over the known world now. You wouldn't have thought that at that day. And that's why the people didn't think that. They were fearful of Saul. But thank goodness Barnabas had the gift of the spirit, of discerning spirits or whatever it was that led him to go by Paul's side. Saul, Paul, wherever you want to say it, where we change his name in Luke. And Jesus didn't change his name. Luke just starts calling him by Paul instead of Saul, just so you know that. I'm sure you already do. But anyway, who would have guessed that? But Barnabas was by his side. And as you're reading this, Barnabas is a son of encouragement. If anybody's going to be the one in the spotlight, it's going to be Barnabas, but it's not. It's going to be Paul. But Paul isn't in the spotlight because he's crucified with Christ and considers everything else garbage. He just wants to live for Christ now, even though he tried to destroy Christ earlier. But nothing is going to stamp out Jesus in this world. Nothing. Jesus is going to build His church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So if you read in Matthew chapter 21, you read the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as king. The Israelites recognized Jesus as their Messiah. Don't miss this point. The mighty works that He did and everything else, they recognized Him as king. But... It didn't take long where they were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, or did they? Because there was opposition between the religious leaders. There was whatever in my heart where this is not the kind of king that I wanted to sign up for. I wanted the king to come in and bless me and take away all the problems in my life. And if that's the kind of Christianity we teach, then there will be plenty of people on that day because of the, the things that we've taught that will hear, depart from me, I do not know you. Because if Jesus is your Lord, Jesus taught that you will suffer. Now that looks like different things to different people, and I'm not going to go all down that track today. But when you're down and out, when you're suffering, you know that Jesus has faced everything that you will ever face and more. He can empathize with you. He loves you. And He took all of your shame, all of your pain, all of your judgment upon His shoulders. And God was satisfied with His sacrifice so that you could be a child of God. Wow! As you read in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus cleanses the temple. <clears throat> he goes from there to get fruit from a fig tree, but there's not any, right? So then there's not a blessing for the fig tree, there's a cursing for the fig trees. Learn from these lessons. Jesus' authority is questioned by the religious leaders and He gives a parable about working or not working in the vineyard. Think about that. It's a parable about wicked tenant farmers of the vineyard. And yeah, we want to focus that to the children of Israel and we don't want to really focus that to the church, but it has implications for the church as well because we're all called to be workers we're called to handle the keys of the kingdom of heaven, to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, to be a holy, set-apart people, to be priests that lead people to God rather than blind leading the blind to destruction. These parables are still about the kingdom of God. That's still our topic. Then Matthew chapter 22, <coughs> excuse me, the chapter starts out this way. Once again, Jesus spoke to them in parables. Here you go. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. There's going to be a celebration. But when the king came in to see the guests, he spotted a man who was not dressed in wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But the man was speechless. And the king told the servants, tie him hand and foot and throw him out into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. We're continuing to see this pattern of not everyone will be in the kingdom of heaven. This started out with Jesus' teachings and the Sermon on the Mount with uh, Matthew's writings. And we see this is still a pattern. Jesus has said, beware, woe, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees. Um, do what you believe your faith to, to, to be, to do that. 
I told you before, if anyone thought they would inherit eternal life, now maybe the church didn't at this point, but the religious leaders did and everything, and Saul himself did. You know, it doesn't matter what other people think. What matters is what I think. But it doesn't matter what I think. It matters what God thinks. I can think all I want to that I am righteous or that I've done this or that or that even my faith is genuine. But like I said last week, there's a point that maybe you've come to, maybe you haven't come to, when you become truly obedient. When Jesus becomes Lord of all. And then you start producing fruit simply because you let God work through you because you're not the one producing the fruit. Jesus tells us in John 14 that we can produce nothing apart from Him. He is the vine and we are the branches. If you keep reading in Matthew 22, or 23, excuse me, in verse 23 we hear, Woe! Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint, dill, and cumin, but you have disregarded the weightier matters of law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former, you blind guides. I wonder if Paul ever heard those words, if he ever meditated on those words. But we're caught up in what we are doing and we don't see what we're not doing and then we rely on what we are doing as our righteousness. But none are righteous, no, not one. And whoever thinks they're the most righteous, just looks the most righteous, their righteousness are as filthy rags to God. We need a Savior. We need Jesus. And if He has saved you, then He says that He must be Lord. Because if you truly believe He has saved you, why would He not be Lord of your life? <clears throat> if you go back and look... At the earlier verses, chapter 3 says, So practice and observe, or verse 3, excuse me, says, So practice and observe everything they tell you. They, they know the scriptures, but they do not do what they do. They do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Do not do what they do. I knew I was saying it wrong. But do not do what they do, <clears throat> for they do not practice what they preach. Verse 5, all their deeds are done for men to see. Verse 12, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. You've got to be a hearer of the word and a doer of the word. You've got to do it for the right reasons, because you love Jesus with all of your heart. What did Jesus do? He humbled himself, even to the point of laying down his life to save a friend. Does your life resemble Jesus? Then we get all of these woes. <clears throat> Verse 13, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let in those who wish to enter. Woe to you, because you are te teaching something that you don't practice. You might know the scriptures. You might know they say to love your enemy, but do you? And if you're teaching that kind of heresy, you could be leading others astray also. I mean, that's what it says here. You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let in those who wish to enter. Because you're teaching heresy. Are you te teaching by how you're living that your faith is genuine, that you believe in Jesus? Are you following after His pattern? But you can't do on your own. You've got to let the Holy Spirit change you. Verse 15, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You traverse land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. I believe that's to the point, is it not? You're not entering into the kingdom of heaven and the convert that you do make is going to wind up in hell with you. Verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You pay tithes of mint, dill, and cumin, but you have disregarded the weightier matters of the law, which are justice, mercy, and faithfulness. 
Justice. Not something that you're going to take care of, but God is going to take care of. And you know what that means? He's going to take care of you if He needs to. But He is going to take care of you because He loved you so much that He sent His one and only Son that by faith you're saved because of God's grace. Not anything that you do, simply that you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Wow. God is so great. And He desires mercy and faithfulness. Mercy is giving something that you don't deserve to your enemies, whatever it might be. To be faithful that regardless of any circumstance in your life or anything else, that you fix your eyes on Jesus and that you know that not a hair on your head will be harmed unless God knows about it and it's in His will. But His will is for you to produce fruit, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. <clears throat> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, verse 25, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Look good on the outside, but inside, where it matters, you're still filthy. And the things that are mentioned here are greed and self-indulgence. Isn't that the ways of people in this world today? We know it in the United States. That's what they're driven by. What I can gain, what I can get out of life, and that's why there's so much emptiness in it that you see the more and more and more they obtain, the more and more empty they are. Because you can't fill your life with created things. You have to fill your life with the Creator. And you can't let those other things be idols or distractions. You have to take them out of your life. Know that they're blessings that we have our freedom and our health and everything else. But if you didn't have those things, would you still be faithful? Would you still thank God? Maybe we need to read Job. Put that into our reading. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bone and every kind of impurity. Anything other than Jesus Christ leads to death. Eternal death, not physical death. Eternal separation from God. From anything and everything that is from God. Anything that is good you will never experience ever, ever again. <clears throat> In the same way, verse 28, on the outside you appear to be righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You say one thing, but you do another. You think one thing, but you're really not. You are a hypocrite. You are only an actor on a stage playing out a role. You are wicked. Verse 33, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape the sentence of hell? It is the judgment for sin. And all you've got to do to be pardoned from your sin is by God's grace have faith in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Simple, but so hard. What a perfect plan. God is so great. All you've got to do is truly believe. But I'll remind you again, if you believe, then how will that make you act? How will you respond to that if you truly believe it? Plain and simple, Jesus will become your everything. That point of conversion, who knows? But as you walk down that path, if you're walking from that side of the room to that side of the room, if you look back, and I don't mean look back like take your hand off the plow. I mean look back at where you've been, you should see the progress of becoming more Christ-like. We are infants in Christ when we first believe, and that's all we need to do is have childlike mustard seed faith. But the longer that we breathe and live, the more that we should live for Jesus and the more we should be able to look back and see a change. And the more that we should be able to look forward and see Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you remember back in Jesus' first sermon, because we're going to get to Jesus' last sermon before His Passion today, in Matthew chapter 7, I want to remind you of these words. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. 
Enter through the narrow gate. It's small. It's not easy. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Some people just say, hey, I'm going to go it. Others don't. They think they're relying on their own righteousness, but they still enter in through that gate. Many enter through it. Verse 14, in contrast, but small is the gate and narrow the way that leads to life. And only a few find it. Let me remind you again that Paul persecutes those who follow the way, that follow this way of life. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You cannot take away faith and works. <laughs> they are one in the same. Get me there. But you don't have to have works to get you to heaven. It's not by works that you're saved. This is such a complex thing to think about, uh, a uh, part of religion, so to speak, but it's not. If you are, you will. But never doing this will never make you believe, will never make you are. Do you understand that? It's not by works of righteousness. But you can't, on the other hand of the side of the coin, say like a lot of Christians who, well, I'm saved and I know it, but I'm still going to live this way. And that may not be a bad way. It may just be simply, I'm not going to give my all to Jesus right now. I'm going to say, you're Lord of my life in all these places, but I'm still holding on to this one. We're not talking about in the depths of your depravity. We're talking about simply not making Jesus Lord. Is He or isn't He Lord of all? And we need to examine that and know that our faith is genuine because many will be turned away that day and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As I said, I can't fathom that. How terrible that will be that day when people thought they were doing what was right, when they thought they had faith. And it's game over at that point. Jesus tells them plainly so they get it. Depart from me. I do not know you. You are saved by faith through grace. And if it is genuine... There will be fruit in your life if you have a chance to live your life. The thief on the cross is the example that does not. But you are here today. You have proclaimed your salvation. So are you producing fruit? Does your life look more like Christ? And let me tell you something about a hypocrite. Generally speaking, you know that he's an actor on a stage. So who or she? So who is watching you if your faith isn't genuine? You don't believe those children are watching you? Because they're watching you. Do you want to be that blind guy that's leading the blind into, into destruction? I know I don't want to be. So it makes my soul, my heart cry out to God to not be that hypocrite. Because it's so easy to have idols in your life. To think you're doing the right things, but you're doing for your motive rather than God's motive. Even in things of like giving you, I'm going to go out and feed the poor and, and do this or that, but is, are you doing it because you think you ought to do it or because God's calling you to do it? We're going to get there because G Jesus said if you give a cup of water to the least of these. That ain't much, guys. That's where we're going to wind up today. I'm going to give you spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Chapter 24 and chapter 25, we know that is the Olivet Discourse. Jesus' final teachings to His disciples about the kingdom of heaven and about the job they're supposed to do until Jesus returns. And it's about worldly things and worldly signs, but it's so much more about spiritual things and the kingdom of heaven. And some of the things that Jesus talks about come true in A.D. 70. You know that. Some of these things are, are about the, the kingdom of Israel. Some of these things are about the church. Some of these things are about how you are to live for Jesus if you truly believe. Jesus warns His followers of perils and trials. Chapter 24, verse 4, See to it that no one deceives you, 
Because that's the reason these things come. They come to prove your faith or discredit your faith. See to it that you're not alarmed, verse 6. Verse 9, they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because the multiplication of wickedness, is that where we're at in this world today? The multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. You know, it's a sad thing that there are a lot of good people out there that show more love than the church shows love. There are more government programs to feed the poor than there are church programs to feed the poor. Maybe I'm wrong on those. Maybe I'm saying I'm wrong, but it seems that way. Is the church being the hands and feet of Jesus? So you don't lose your focus of your mission. Jesus goes on to say this, and the, go the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Well, let's look back at Stephen and how he preached the gospel and it cost him his life. How Philip preached the gospel and he just went along but he was obedient. And like I said, if you read on, you'll realize that after Philip started going through Samaria and preaching more like this, he wound up in a town that he probably settled in and had his children and raised his children up. It's about preaching Jesus as you go along where Jesus has you placed. If he calls you out of this mission field and calls you to go overseas, then great. Listen to him. Just like Philip did. Be transported. Whatever, whatever <laughs> happens. But if not, you're a witness right here to your spouse to your mother, your father, to your children, your siblings, your grandchildren. They need to not see hypocrisy in you. They need to see Jesus in you while you have a chance to show them. Because there will come a day when you're gone or when Jesus comes back and there won't be any more showing them. And you show them by the way you do, not just by what you say. So be ready, because it'll come as in the days of Noah, people will be eating and drinking. It doesn't mean that the days of Noah were bad, it just means that was the normal. And then a flood is coming, the destruction is coming. And whoever did not enter into the ark was destroyed. Whoever does not enter into the ark of Jesus will be forever separated from God. Verse 44, for this reason... You must also be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour that you do not expect. Verse 45, Who then is the faithful and wise servant? The last teachings of Jesus. The last parables of Jesus. Further teaching illustrations. However you want to say it. Who then is faithful and wise servant? Isn't that what you want to be? I don't want to just be a servant. I want to be a faithful and wise servant. I don't want to just get to heaven. I want to hear, well done. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of his household to give the others their food at the proper, proper time? Physical food and spiritual food. Verse 46, Blessed is that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Now I've told you what blessed means before. Blessed means that you're blessed because of your position, that you're in a right standing of God, not because of the things that happen to you or don't happen to you. And if you'll notice right here, blessed is that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Because that servant is doing, not just hearing. He's hearing and obeying. He is producing fruits that prove his repentance, his faith. Because there'll be servants here that are told to depart from Jesus because they don't know Him. Blessed because of their right standing is that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Faith leads to fruit production. Verse 47, Truly I tell you, He'll put him in charge of all his possessions. Then we see the rewards. Verse 48, But, what does that mean? Complete opposite. But, suppose that servant, we're still talking about a servant here, is wicked and says in his heart where he should have believed, but there's still sin in his heart because he's not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. My master will be away a long time. 
Verse 49, he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat, with drunk, dr eat, and, eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day he does not expect and an hour he does not anticipate. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we try to take that parable and tear it all apart and what does this mean beating and everything else? Let's just take it with the childlike faith again. Servants are supposed to serve until their master returns. They've been given the authority and the power to take care of their master's business until he returns. When the master returns and that servant is not doing that, is the master going to be pleased? Are there going to be repercussions? We don't have to dig it that far in theology to know that we're supposed to be serving until the master returns, especially if we love the master. Chapter 25. Jesus goes on to tell a few more parables. He tells a parable of ten virgin, virgins, which is a point of readiness. There are ten virgins here. Five who are wise, five who are foolish. So again, don't take too much depth of what the virgins mean, anything else. There are half that are wise, there are half that are foolish. What happens? They all fall asleep, so they're not all ready necessarily because distractions come and everything. But five are considered wise and five are foolish. And what happens to the wise ones? They enter into the celebration. Now you can go back and study that more because like I said, I'm not going to spend the time on this one. But the wise ones, even though they fell asleep, are wise enough to do what it takes to enter into the celebration. The foolish ones will hear, I do not know you. The door won't be open no matter how much they knock. Jesus then tells a parable of what we call the parable of talents, the money or resources that we've been given to be good stewards of, that we're entrusted with until the master returns. We're doing business on the behalf of our master while he's away, but there will be a time when he returns and he settles accounts. Two servants here. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. The joy of your master. <laughs> the joy of God himself. The things that he has planned for those who love him. Wow. I, I, I can't fathom. I can't even begin to fathom. I can't begin to fathom eternity, let alone the things that He has planned and, and the realization that I'll have of how wonderful and good He is and how much praise and honor He deserves. No wonder I'll never be able to stop praising and singing His name. Two servants here, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. They both were given different amounts, but they both did something with what they were given. Then in verse 30, you read these words. Throw that worthless servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a servant who has been entrusted, but does nothing with what he's been entrusted. Man, that's scary again. This is a servant. He knew he was a servant. He knew his master was harsh, so he just held on to what he gave him, but he didn't do anything with it. And there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. There isn't saved by the flames here. There is thrown out into the darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, I'm not going to spend all day on what this means, but you go back and contemplate what it means to you. This is Jesus' final teachings to those who have chose to follow Him. Think about it from the, those, those perspectives. 
Peter's hearing these words and he's got to process these words and what they mean. And we see it a process in Peter's life because Philip had to tell him that the Samaritans were okay because they're all men are creating God's image. Could you quit halberding that, that against your brother? There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus then tells a story that we like to call the parable of the sheep and goats. Okay, here we are. And who's going to say, I know I look like a sheep. I know I sound like a sheep. I'm doing all these things that sheep do, but I'm really a goat. No, I think I'm a sheep. Am I? Because it doesn't matter how much you look like, act like. That's why Jesus says, you hypocrites. You're not a sheep if you're not a sheep. <laughs> and the only way you're a sheep is to believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Believe. Not just say you do. Not believe it's, it's going to rain someday. But to know without a doubt that Jesus is who He says He is, to put your faith and trust in Him, and then your life will never be the same. And it won't be the same because of you. It'll be the same, it won't be the same because God puts His Spirit in you. You will be sanctified through and through Jesus in you so that Jesus comes through you so that you are like Jesus for all eternity. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is Jesus' final sermon, illustration, parable, whatever you want to say, in the book of Matthew before He goes and lays down His life for His Sheep. Remember the words of Jesus from chapter 12. The disciples came to Him and said, Why do you speak in parables? Jesus replied in verse 11 of chapter 12, The knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. I truly believe, I'll say I again, that the more that you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, the more you're probably not going to hear Him. Whether it's He quits speaking to you or what reason it is. So today is the day of the Lord's salvation. Today is the day to not not listen to God's calling in your life. Whatever that whisper is, whatever that you're raging a battle with, and I know I use example a lot because I know it's there, that enemy of ours down the road that he did this one time, or even in our own family that we have estranged relationships because of something they did, when a lot of times it's something I probably did too. If this is not a warning, then here, let me help you. Wake up! <laughs> Jesus' last teachings to those who are following Him. There will be a day, Jesus says, when I separate for all eternity. I don't care if you think you've been in the, in the sheep pen this whole time. I know who are my sheep. They hear my voice. They respond to it. They will not respond to another. <clears throat> Let's read through the parable real quick. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. Goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for, the, for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, <clears throat> into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick in prison, and you did not visit me. And they too will reply, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or strange, uh, or a stranger or naked or sick, in per sick or in prison and did not minister to you? I'm going to stop there. What would you hear? Because if you don't focus on this, you hear what I did. That's why I started with by grace you're saved through faith. It is a matter of what you do with it, not a matter of what you've done. Lord, Lord, we've done mighty things in your name. We even cast out demons. But he says, depart from me, I do not know you. Not about what you've done. No works of righteousness. It's about what you do with the gift of God, which is salvation through Jesus Christ. Because if you've been given new life, what are you going to do with that life? Can you be the same? Are you going to live for Him if it really meant anything to you? It's not about what we've done. It's about our heart. Verse 31, when the Son of Man comes. Not if, when. It's a fact. When Jesus comes and we don't know the hour, so be ready. Be wise, virgin, not a foolish virgin. Be a good servant who is doing with what God entrusted him to do. He will come with all of his angels. All of heaven's armies will come. There is no doubt. Jesus came as a baby born in a manger before. He is coming as the King of kings when he returns and every knee will bow. Every created being. He will sit on His glorious throne. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before Him. doesn't matter how lowly you are or how great you are. You will be gathered before the King. And the next thing, He will separate the people one from another. No middle ground, no woulda, coulda, shoulda. He will separate sheep from goats. He will do this as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king, notice it's the son of man before, but now it's king because everyone will realize who King Jesus is. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come. He told you from the beginning, come and I will make you a fisher of men. Come now that you've done that and enter into glory. You are blessed by my Father because of your right standing, not because of your circumstances. The world thought that you, you were foolish, but you were blessed. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You were designed and created to be with God, to have fellowship with Him. 4, verse 35, which is a preposition tying these together, how the sheep will be known. Because if they are true sheep, that happens first, then they will do. And they will do out of the motives of a pure heart, not the motives out of an evil heart. What does Jesus say? 4, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, you visited me. Do you see any big ministries here? I mean, there's not a prison ministry here. It's I went to see someone who was in prison. You don't have to have a prison ministry. You don't have to have a food bank. You have to be willing to feed that person who needs to be fed physically and spiritually. 
You need to have enough compassion when that person is in prison or in the hospital to go visit them because they might just need a word of encouragement from you. And if the Spirit is poking at you to do that, you certainly don't want to go against the Spirit. There's no big, mighty things here. The least of these can do these. You don't need a bigger bank account. You don't need anything else. You need your two feet to go and tell about Jesus as you go. And if you notice, I were these things. You're ministering to Jesus when you minister to someone else. Doesn't say these are brothers or sisters either. Don't put that in there. They're human beings who need salvation. And you are called to bring them salvation, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. If you'll notice also, they didn't even know they did it. That's the real cool thing here because the motivation is right from the heart. Now maybe you can go back and see those other guys that said, Lord, we did mighty works in your... They knew they did it. These people didn't even know they were doing it because they did what sheep do. Follow the shepherd. They do what's in their heart. Love because God first loved them. They do what they can't help but do and have compassion and mercy on even their enemies because that's exactly what Jesus did. So this is normal for them because they are sheep. So they say, the righteous will answer in verse 37, Lord, when did we do this? When did we see, see you and feed you, clothe you? When did we see you? Verse 40, And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And like I said, don't take brothers out of context because that's not what it means here. What you did for someone, you did for me. We can't take that brothers or we'll be right back to the Samaritan situation again. Jesus has already proved himself there in the book of Acts. And it took Peter a long time to figure that out. But then we have the opposite. Verse 41, he'll say to those on your left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for humanity, but it's where they'll wind up. Four, preposition. I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. I was naked, you did not clothe me. All these are personal pronouns. I was sick in prison and you did not visit me. And they too will reply, they too, Lord, when did we see you? Because we saw the world and we had programs for the world and we did that. Like I said, the government feeds more people in the United States than the church ever thought about feeding. Good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> it's a fact. Because they have moral obligations to whatever the reason is. They will and buy votes. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you can't deny that these people fed other people, visited other people. So that's not the point. It's a heart point. I did it for whatever my motives were versus I did it because I'm a sheep and I follow my master who gave up heaven, didn't have a place to lay his head, and then died for me. King Jesus will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. He will place sheep on his right and goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the, from the foundation of the world. That other place is not prepared for you, but it's by faith that you're saved through grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you truly believe in Jesus? Verse 45 as opposed to goats and what they look like. The king will answer, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And they will go away into eternal punishment. But, there's one of those big buts in the Bible, the righteous into eternal life. 
two choices, two destinations. Whether you believe in Jesus Christ, whether you are a sheep, and whether you live like a sheep. Now, I'm started out again. Salvation is by grace because there's so many doctrines in the church that teach otherwise. Grace plus works. Whatever it is, by grace you're saved. And if you are of Jesus, you will be like Jesus in this world. Don't be fooled. In Acts chapter 9, we never dreamed the story would go this way. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord. Who would have thought that this was God's plan, that he's in this much control, that the one who is destroying the church will become a builder of churches? He approached the high priest and requested letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any man, woman, belonging to the way, this living a life like Jesus lived because they're truly sheep. He could bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As Saul drew near to Damascus on his journey though, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Wait a minute. Saul was persecuting people. Oh, just like we read in that parable. What you've done to these, you've done to me. Paul is destroying Jesus by destroying people. But Jesus is a Savior, and He's our Lord. He replied, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, He replied. Verse 6, Now get up, and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Anyone who wants to follow me will. Anyone. What? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow after Jesus. If anyone does not do that, you go read the words and see what it says. I'll leave it there for you. Who would have thought that this is where we're at in Acts? And the people didn't believe. They're scared. Like I said, I'll give you some spoiler alerts there. Barnabas takes him under his wings. It looks like Barnabas is Zeus to the people. But Barnabas is just helping Paul realize who he is in Jesus. Any of us can be forgiven. The parable of the sheep... Slash goats was Jesus' last teaching before His passion. There will be a marriage celebration, but the problem is for many it will be a great divorce. What a sad thing. I'm going to read you Ephesians 2, 8, and 10, 2, 8 through 10 from the New Living Translation to point out something that they interpret. Verse 8, God saved you, you, by His grace. When? When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. That's why I like the New Living Translation. Yes, it's God's work in us. He, we are His workmanship, but we are created in Christ Jesus to be a masterpiece. Something that people look at and recognize and say, that's not the Alan I used to know. That's not whatever. That is Jesus living in and through Alan. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So, there's this word. We can do the good things that He planned for us all along, long ago. We are created to do good works. The only way we can do good works is to believe in Jesus and be a sheep and follow after Him. Married or divorced, nobody enters into a marriage wanting a divorce. Come on, guys. No one ever expected that. It's not a happy time. 
There will be many that day that say, Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I don't know you. It is our job, if we truly believe, to live like Jesus so that we're not spreading heresy or we're not teaching hypocrisy, but we're teaching Jesus Christ to those that experience us, who come into our lives, especially those that are our heritage and a blessing from the Lord, our children and our grandchildren. There's only two people in a marriage covenant too, a man and a wife, two people. The reason divorce happens is one's not committed to the other, isn't it? It's not Jesus. Jesus is committed. How in the world could you say He's not if He gave His life up to save you? So that the difference is, is are you committed to Him? And I'll put it this way into a physical marriage again. When you see those marriages where one person gives and gives and gives and gives to the other and the other doesn't, that's not a marriage at all, is it, guys? It's a marriage who's one step away from a divorce. And you know, it may not happen in this world, but it will happen. I'm not talking about a physical divorce. I'm talking about you meeting your maker face to face. God saved you by His grace when you believed. You cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So <clears throat> none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that He planned for us long ago. Pledge your life to a spotless marriage. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that Jesus would call us to be his own, that there is a wedding celebration being planned for the Son, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. We thank you for Jesus Christ and his passion, his love, his mercy, his grace. We thank you for his obedience and the joy that was set before him to face the cross so that we might could live. Lord, I pray that if there are any who are living a lie, Lord, that they come to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ. For all of us, Lord, if there are any obstacles standing in the way or any sins that entangles us, I pray, Lord, that we just give them all away, that we lay them at the feet of Jesus, that we live like Jesus in this world, that we realize the opportunity and the breath of life that we still have to live like Jesus, to be an example, to show people the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, may we not stand in the way of Jesus, but may we stand up for Jesus boldly, no matter our freedoms or our persecutions that face us, Lord. May we fix our eyes on Jesus until He returns. We pray this in His precious name. Amen.